You excited to be here tonight? Amen. Psalms 103, and we're going to start in verse 10. Love this psalm. And he hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. Can you thank him for that? For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward with them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. For the wind passeth over it, and it is gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto his children's children. Now just turn over um, to 1 John with me. I'm just going to read two scriptures. 1 John chapter 3, verse 19. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. I love that. Verse 20. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart. Think about that. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart, and he knoweth all things. Father God, I thank you tonight. I thank you, God, that you show us mercy. I thank you for the steadfast love of the Lord. I thank you, Father God, that your love, it never ceases, Father. And Lord, it just never ceases to amaze me, Lord God, that it is your love that has kept us and preserved us, Father. While so many have given up on us, Lord, and sometimes we've even given up on ourselves, Father. But because of your faithfulness, God, and who you are, Father, you never give up on us, God. And Father, I just ask tonight, God, that you would give us ears to hear and eyes to see what the Spirit is saying. Lord, I pray, God, freedom, Lord, freedom over your people, because the Bible says that whom the Son has set free is free indeed, Father God. And freedom is not just a theory, but it is our reality, Father God. It is why, Christ, you gave your life for us. So, Father, I ask you, Lord, to anoint this word tonight and let your word go forth like seed and let it re not return unto you void, but God, let it accomplish that for which you have sent it, God. Set the captive free tonight, God. Lord, I ask, Father God, that every person in this place that suffers from guilt over the past, Father God, Lord, that you would just release them from it tonight, Father God. Lord, that they would know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you have taken their mistakes, Lord God. You have taken their sins, and you have thrown them as far as the east is from the west, Father God. That you are no respecter of persons tonight, God. That what you've done for one God, you will do for another, Father. I thank you for that, Father. And we praise you and we thank you. And all God's people said, Amen and amen. You may be seated in his presence. Uh, this is the third part of our a new series that we've been in called Freedom Fighters. Uh, you may wonder why I would name it Freedom Fighters, and that's because every freedom that we have, it's been fought for. For the basic freedom that we have, people have lived their life they have fought and they have given their lives so that we might be free. And Jesus was no different. Jesus gave his life so that we no longer would be bound by sin, that we would no longer be bound by the past. But even though Jesus did that, many Christians today are still bound by something. 
There, there, there might be a fear. There might be a thought. There might be um, just a dysfunctional uh, a pattern and cycle in your life that you have not been able to break. And the Bible says that whom the Son is set free is free indeed. And that word indeed, it means a reality. This freedom is for real. It is not just theory. It's not just something that we come to church and we just say, you know, I'm free, I'm free, and then walk home bound. Um, God is so interested in you being whole. Because here's the key. If we're not whole, how do we really possess and walk in everything that Christ gave his life for? Amen. Christ gave his life so that we could be whole in every circumstance, spiritually, physically, financially, mentally, emotionally, amen, um, with nothing. Because when, we when we were created, the Bible says in Psalms 139 that we were fearfully and wonderfully made. There is no mistake in you. God created you the way you were. He wired you together for a purpose and for a reason. Aren't you glad about that? Sometimes you wonder why you are the way you are. And God said, I've wired you that way. Why? Because you've got to be that way. You've got to have that gift. You've got to have that talent in order for you to do what I've called you to do. And his purpose that he placed on you and that he spoke over you, that's coming to pass. Amen? But sometimes it gets a little bit difficult in life um, when, when we're going through life and things happen. Life happens. Anybody ever have life just happen to them? Amen? Um, and, you know, sometimes I think one of the things that really um, keep people bound from moving on into their future is their past. And God just keeps talking to me about different mistakes and choices that we've made. And I believe that one of the biggest strongholds in a Christian life is this thing called guilt. Amen. Amen. And sometimes in life, um, how do you unscramble the egg that's broken? See, but what I love about God is that God's not looking to unscramble the egg. God takes that egg that's broken, and he makes something beautiful out of it. When you think about it, Anytime you go to a breakfast buffet or brunch, the longest line is always the line for the omelet station. And what is an omelet? An omelet is nothing but a broken egg. It is an egg that is scrambled. And yet, an egg that's scrambled and you can't put the egg back together the way it originally was, all of a sudden you just start to add some stuff to it. If you like vegetables, if you like meat, you like cheese, maybe you like all three of them and put it in the omelet, all of a sudden out of something that was broken can become something beautiful and something really good. Amen? And so I want to encourage you tonight that, if you, that you're going to get free from the scrambled eggs in your life. Because understand that everything is about perception. It is about how you see it. It's why Paul says that we have to put on the mind of Christ. It is not something that we just automatically have. It is something that Paul says you have to put it on. Philippians 4.8, it tells us that whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, these are the things that you think on. Joshua, God told Joshua, he said, I want you to take my word and you have to meditate on this day and night. Because it is so important that we stop seeing our life through the eyes of our flesh. And to see our life through the eyes of God. How God can take the ashes of your life and give you beauty for it. God doesn't waste any of the pain that you've been through. Anybody got any pain? Anybody ever go through something and you wonder, why in the world did I ever have to go through this? I will tell you that if you went through it 
and God brought you through it, he did it because there's a reason. There have been so many scrambled eggs in my life, but God has made a beautiful omelet out of it. Things when I was going through it, I could not understand. And frankly, I didn't want to understand. Have you ever been there? You know, it, it's like sometimes when you're going through something and somebody's telling you, but there's good coming out of it, good. And, and, and sometimes you just say, you know what? Thank you, Kathy. I, this, that's my girl over there. She can, she can say it. I don't really care what's coming. I don't, I don't want this. And I'm talking about big things. You know, when, when I lost my dad, it, it, was, it was really, I mean, I can't believe this year. It's going to be 24 years that I lost my dad. And, you know, I, and I can remember going to the funeral and everybody was saying, you know, praise the Lord. It's graduation day. He's with the Lord. And this is what you've been singing at. And yet, you know, I knew all of that. And I'm glad my father was with the Lord. But quite honestly, that wasn't doing anything for me. Because I was just, I wanted him here. And at that point in time, I didn't really, I see, there was a lot of good that came out of it. But I wasn't focused on that. Why? Because when we're in a circumstance, all, you know, because of, of our flesh and where we are, we tend to get locked in that circumstance. But God is saying, I need you to come up higher and I need you to see things through the crimson lens. I want you to understand that that verse, Romans 8 and 28, that it says, God works all things for good for them that love God and are called according to his purpose. What he's saying there is your egg might be scrambled, but I'm telling you, I'm going to make an omelet. I'm going to make something out of this that when you look back, you might not feel it right now. You might not want to accept this right now, but come 10, 15 years down the pike, you're going to look back and you're going to say, God, I thank you for the mountain. I thank you that, 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 I, that I did go through it. And one day when I see him face to face, I, I might have a conversation, although at that point I really won't care, but I, I would like to sit down and say, now exactly why did you choose this? <laughs> well, why, why did you make it all you know, go like that? I mean, wouldn't it have been easy? But that's where when you start to put on the mind of Christ, you can start to thank God for every single trial and tribulation that you've been through because if there was no test, there would never be a testimony. And what a testimony is, it's just another level and another dimension of how personally you know God. Because every test and every trial, when it becomes a testimony, there's, there's an assurance and a confidence that we have in God. See, that's one thing that the body of Christ truly suffers from. And it's that we don't have a confidence of who we are in God. Yes, most of us have that confidence that God, yes, there's nothing too hard, and God can do anything. But where we struggle is, will God do it? And you got to understand, if you understand who he is as a father and who you are as his child, yeah, God will do it. May not do it how you want it or when you want it, but God will do it because he's faithful like that. I've seen God restore so many things. I mean, even, even relationships, you know, that when somebody would walk out and you would think, oh, my heart is broken. I, I'll, I'll never have another friend like that again. I'll never trust again. And God says, just can you put it all in my hands and trust me. And you know what? It's like as soon as you release something, God turns around and he does something. And God will restore people. God will restore. They might be different. It, you might not see. You might not understand it. But God will do it because God is faithful. Amen? And I love the way um, Julia Child, when she would cook in the kitchen, she, she kind of had, I guess, Rachel Ray um, picked up her philosophy because when Rachel Ray was being discovered, I think it was by Oprah and the networks, and she said to them, she says, listen, she said, I'm really not a fancy cook. She says, what I cook is good. She goes, but like, I I'm not really, um, you know, classy. She says, I drop things on the floor, and she says, and I spill things, and I'm a little bit of a mess. And she says, you know, and I don't apologize. Julia, Julia Child was the same way. When she cooked, she says, if something doesn't turn out, she was never apologize. 
Don't apologize for it. Work around it. Make something. Make something beautiful of it. And when we come through a circumstance in life, that's the way that we need to look at our lives. That God, whatever is broken right now, whatever eggs are scrambled, you're going to make an omelet out of this. Why? Because to understand God and to have that freedom, I have to understand who he is. And if God says that I am able to keep that which I commit, if I've committed my life to him, then I have to know that I know that no matter what I'm going through, God is going to keep me through it. But when it comes to this thing called guilt, and there, there's, two types, um, there's two types of guilt. Sometimes, you know, we, we, do, we do things, we make wrong choices, and, and we suffer from guilt because we've, we've done um, the wrong thing. But the Bible says that when we sin, he is able and just to forgive. That when we come to God, no matter what we've done, Okay, if you want to make it the worst of the worst of sins to the very smallest of sin, to God, sin is sin. He doesn't, there's no big sin or little sin, although different sins have bigger or smaller consequences. Sin is still sin to God, and sin is what separates us. But when we come to God and we ask God to forgive us of whatever it is that we've done, he says, I take you, he goes, he says, I forgive you. And he says, and I take your sin and I throw it as far as the east is from the west. And I don't remember it anymore. Now, if he's God and he doesn't remember his sin, any, uh, your sin anymore, then why we keep dwelling on it? Because if you ask God for forgiveness and he forgives you, if you go back to him five minutes later and say, do you remember that sin? He'll say, what sin? I take the word of God as literal. God does not remember it. Whom the Son has set free is free indeed. It is a reality that when you are locked in a prison and because you've done something wrong and God opens that door, you are free. And with God, there's no parole officer. There's no condition. You're free. The only condition is go and sin no more. And sometimes guilt, see, all these things that come into our lives, God will use it for good and Satan will use it for evil. Because guilt sometimes is a good thing. Because guilt shows you that you have a conscience. And it shows you that you know right from wrong. Amen? If you didn't, what, what scares me is when people can do things and not realize they're wrong. Because part of their conscience has gone. And listen, if you have a conscience, it means that you've got the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is a teacher and he lives inside of you and he says, listen, that's a mistake. Don't go there. Don't do that. Don't partake in this. Don't partake in that. Don't run with that crowd. And it tells you, he tells you what is right and what is wrong. So it's sometimes guilt is a good thing because it can point you into the direction. It will tell you that you know that it's wrong. And when you start to feel that guilty feeling, you go to God and you confess your sin. And when you confess your sin, he takes it and he forgets about it. It goes into the sea of forgetfulness. But Satan will use guilt to destroy a person. Do you understand what I mean when I said about guilt being a good thing? Because it can point you in the right, okay. But, but guilt, Satan uses it to destroy you. He keeps you stuck in the past. And God just keeps saying the phrase to me over and over again. You cannot drive forward looking in the rear view mirror. If you keep doing that, just think about it. Don't try it. Okay, <laughs> but if you did that, just think about what would happen if you're looking. And I, and I shared this a few weeks ago. I'm somebody that when I drive and I'm, I'm on that Jersey Turnpike all the time, and I like a lot of distance in front of me, and I like a lot of distance in the back of me. And one day when I was driving, 
there was a guy, there was a person, you know, behind me, and he was so close. And I, I tried to move over, and I just, I, I kept, but I kept looking in my rearview mirror at what this guy was doing. And little did I know that while I'm watching what was going on behind me, I almost crashed into the guy in front of me. And so in that moment, boy, you can get a sermon out of anything, okay, when you're listening to God. God said, you can't drive forward. You can't look at your future and look in the rearview mirror at the same time. And God is more about your future than he is about your past. Why? Because when Christ died, he destroyed your past. He covered your past with his blood. And he says, now I want you to move on to your future. And what guilt does to people is it keeps you in your past. Because while God has forgiven you, anybody ever struggle with this? You, you said, well, I, I, you know, you, there, there are people that struggle with a certain thing, with a certain memory, with a certain something or other that happened in their life. And they've asked God over and over and over again to forgive them. And yet, they can't seem to move forward. Because any time start, God starts dealing with their future, what happens? Have you ever tried in your life to step forward and make a new change and say, God, uh, this is the day where I'm going for what you have for me. And it's like, I'm telling you, in a short time, all of a sudden, whatever that was in your past, Satan starts bringing your past up to you. And all you start thinking about is what you did and the choices that you made rather than looking to what God has in front of you. Satan will bring you a past up to you because he'll try to distract you. And this happens with soul ties, with relationships. It's funny because I've had people in my past that um, hurt me. And I really, listen, I forgave them. I let it go. And I would appreciate if I just never saw them again. And sometimes I, I end up running into these people. And, and it's such, I'm telling you, it is like such warfare that happens to me in that moment. Because there's a part of me that when I see the person, it's the emotion of, of, of the event, of the trauma that I, that I went through, that I so want to open up my mouth and start saying whatever it is that I want to say, you know? And yet, I've got God on the other side saying, because I'll ask God, why, why are you doing this? This is like torture. And he would say to me, because sometimes you don't realize how far you've come. Sometimes you don't realize, and I have to remind you, Look at them. They're in the same place. But look at you. Look at how far I've brought you. Bobby and I ran into some people, you know, at the beach. And, and some of the, I, I tell you, it's like when, when they look at us, it's like they saw a ghost. And they, and they look and, and, and they start to stutter. And they say, you, you, you guys haven't aged a bit. In, in fact, you even look better. What, what, what happened? Because what? look what the Lord has done. Look what God has done. And so sometimes God will allow your past to come up because he has to show you, look at what I delivered you from. If I would have left you there, if, if you would have never suffered that hurt, if they would have never rejected you, you would have been just like them. But because you put your life in my hands, I moved you on. I moved you on. But sometimes when you see or you feel those events from the past, all of a sudden, the emotions start to rise up, and you start to feel this thing called guilt. And this is the kind of guilt that I want to, um, I want to talk to, to you about tonight. Because this is the kind of guilt that is used not as a tool, but as a weapon. 
The guilt that's used as a tool will show you what is right and show you what is wrong and help you to get back on track. But the guilt that is used as a weapon is the one that says things will never change. Is the guilt that says, I'm not changed. I'm not good enough. I can't stand myself. People can't stand me. And, and what happens is in, in this type of guilt, it's not God punishing you, and it's not people punishing you, but you are punishing yourself. And you are punishing yourself for something that you've already been freed from. And that's why some of the greatest sermons, and, and it's something that we always need to talk about, is this thing called forgiveness. And we always talk about forgiveness in the sense of, i got to forgive those who hurt me. And if I gave each and every one of you a microphone, everyone could preach a sermon on forgiveness. Because you know what happens when you don't forgive someone who's hurt you. But the damage is just as bad or sometimes even worse when you don't know how to forgive yourself. We have all sinned. We have all fallen short. We have all had the opportunity to be offended, and we have all had the opportunity to offend. There is not a person on this planet that has not made a mistake. And when you don't forgive yourself, what happens is this spirit of condemnation comes on you. And condemnation is a spirit that will bind you, it will gag you, and it will lock you up because it will make you question who you are in God. It will cause you to forget who you are. God said, you are my child, and I've called you by name. When you walk through the fire, you won't be burned. The waters will not overflow you. He says, I've given you a name. You belong to God. God has forgiven you. You are the king's daughter. You are the king's son. And when you are living under condemnation, you forget that. God called you to be royalty. And when you live under common condemnation, you become nothing but common. And there's nothing common about you. Because you are unique. You were fearfully and wonderfully made. You didn't choose God. God chose you. And we need to get that right. And that is something that you need to, to meditate, that you didn't choose God. So many times people said, I found the Lord. No, you didn't find the Lord. God came and found you in that lost place that nobody cared about. And Jesus came and he dragged you out of that place. And he began to speak to you, and he saved you because he chose you because he has got a pur he, he's got a purpose for your life. And it's so easy to forgive other people because we can say, you know what, they didn't mean it, they didn't know what they were doing, they didn't have the tools, and I can't control what others do. But when it comes to forgiving ourselves, we don't justify it in the same way. We think, well, I made my choice. You know, we all grew up with that saying, well, you make your bed, now you got to lie in it. Well, not if you have the Holy Spirit and not if you have Jesus, because Jesus will come and he'll change your sheets. He'll take you from that dead place and he'll bring you into a place that is full of life, give you joy that is unspeakable and full of glory. Now, listen. To deny the fact that you made a mistake, that's wrong too. And I, I preached on Tuesday that mistakes and failure is never fatal unless you don't learn from them. 
But the way mistakes can be fatal is if you're going to choose to live in that moment. That's why so many people, we make mistakes and we make permanent decisions in temporary situations. Your fall, your mistake, whatever you did, it was temporary. It was a mistake. It was in a fleeting moment. It was over. You give it to God and God releases you. You have got to learn how to forgive yourself. Forgive yourself for doing it. Because many times the choices that you and I make, there are years of reasons why we make the choices we made. Sometimes you just have a bad day. You know, we were, we were kidding around in the back when we were talking about having like mother moments. You know, those moments where you completely, totally lose your mind. Okay. We, okay, are you with me? Okay. Those are those moments where you just become a completely different person. Because your kids would push you. Did you ever just have a bad day? Did you ever just lose it on somebody in the store? Because we all have. Now, if I took a snapshot of you, that snapshot of you in that moment is not who you really are. It's what you did that day, but it is not who you are. And what the enemy wants to do is to try to make you take that snapshot. I mean, just think about it. Patty's yelling at her, her son, okay? And you know what? You got to be careful with your kids today because I was, I was yelling at my daughter one day, and she had a phone. And she was recording me. And I was shocked when she played it back what I saw. I said, you better delete that thing and get rid of it. But just think about it. See, if the enemy can take a snapshot on just that one day that you were yelling at your son, you were a lunatic, said a bunch of things that you didn't mean. What the enemy wants to do is every day, every day that you open up your mouth, really, Patty? Watch this. And what it was, it was one fleeting moment. And now, we're not talking about all the different things that her son was supposed to take out the garbage. Her son was supposed to do the laundry. And her son was supposed to mow the lawn and do this and do that. And, and it was like for weeks telling him what to do. I mean, this is what I do with my kids. And after weeks, but yet in that moment, nobody knows that back story. So a moment of weakness, a, a season in your life, is not who you are. And that's how we get so bound because we think what we went through is actually who we are. Because Satan is every day, he's got that little, that little snapshot of you, and all of a sudden, he just keeps putting that, that one instance in your face. And yet, there's another thousand videos of who you really are. It's like the media. They will focus on the one thing that's bad, but never focus on all the other things that, that, are, that are good and that, that are productive. And sometimes that's how we fixate ourselves in our life. We just go back to that one moment and we think that that one moment, that one mistake, because of the lie that we believed, we think that it's over for us. And sometimes you just have to learn how to say, you know what, self, I forgive you. I forgive you. Yeah. Don't be in denial. Don't be afraid to admit that you did wrong. See, you know, when, you, when confession is good for the soul, just be careful who you confess to. <laughs> be careful. Be careful who you confess to. But if you confess your sins to God... Because his word says, what does he do with it? He doesn't talk about it. He doesn't tell it to anybody else. He takes it and he goes, okay, I forgive you. And then he gets rid of it. Never to bring it up. I mean, because here's the thing. When, when, we, when we face judgment one day, God, we are only going to be judged on the sins that we never confessed. Think about it. We will only be judged on the sins that we never confessed. 
Why? Because when we confessed every other sin, he took that sin and he threw it. As far as he doesn't remember it. There's no reason for him to bring that up. There's no reason for him to judge you on that. Why? Because it's been forgiven. So to make a mistake and say, you know what? I made a mistake. It's a healthy thing. To confess, I I messed up in this area, and now God, help me and give me the grace to get back on track. That's why God gives us grace. Grace is not grease. It does not let us slide over sin, but it gives us the power not to sin and not to come under the condemnation that the enemy wants to put on us. So that when we give, when we give our mistakes to the Lord, instead of in, instead of holding that and not forgiving ourselves, we gotta say, "Listen, God, my egg is scrambled, and I drop my egg and I scramble this thing, Lord. But now I place it in Your hand, and I know, God, that You can make something beautiful out of this." And so the problem that when we don't um, forgive ourselves, there's consequences. Just like there's a consequence when we don't forgive those who have hurt us. We lock ourselves into a prison. But when we don't forgive ourselves and and cut ourselves some slack, sometimes I feel like we're easier on people than we are ourselves. Sometimes we hold ourselves to higher standards. Sometimes some people hold themselves to a higher standard than even God holds them to. Because some people think, well, because you know, when they're, when they're all about control and they have legalistic mindsets because I know what's wrong, I should never do it. That's why I never say you'll never do it. Never say never. God, you know, and sometimes people will look at themselves as perfect and that's such a waste of time. Why? Because God knows you're not perfect. You're only perfect in him. You can't get it right without him. Can you say Amen. So when we don't forgive ourselves, we, we, we lock ourselves into this prison. And, and we don't forget that that sin is gone. And there's, there's such a thing, and, I, and, I, and this was amazing. It's called, um, well, amputees often experience, it's, it's called a phantom limb. And it's, it's the most amazing thing that somebody could, could cut a leg off, and the leg is not there but yet they can feel the pain of the leg as if it was there. And that's the same thing spiritually with us, that God has freed us from these sins, and when we hold on to these things and we don't forgive ourselves, we still feel the pain from the thing that's been cut away. Because God takes your sin and he cuts it away. It doesn't exist anymore. So it's why we have to plead the blood of Jesus over our minds. That God, and put on the mind of Christ and forget those things that lie behind. Listen, I did it. I gave it to God. I confess it. God, forgive me. Now I got to forgive myself. Because unless we, um, we learn how to do that, we're going to suffer a bunch of consequences. And one is self-punishment. We, we, we punish ourselves because we replay our sins over and over in our heart and in, in, our, in our minds to the point that we get to a tortured state. Some people are afraid to step out and try again. Why? Because of a mistake that they made. And I can tell you that every successful person has had more failure than they've had success. But the only reason why they became a success is because they never gave up. They kept trying. The next thing that will come is be uncertainty. You'll live under a cloud of insecurity. And let me tell you something. Insecurity is a really bad friend to make. Because you will begin to, to second guess everything that you want to do in your life, everything that God begins to tell you. You, you you'll, you'll, you'll start to rely on man. You'll start to put your trust in man. You'll start to seek for man's approval. And when you start doing that, you're in big trouble because you will never be able to please man, ever. Is this okay? You guys are quiet. Now, forgiving yourself. 
you'll end up with a sense of unworthiness. Why should God answer my prayer? I'm not good enough. He won't hear anything I have to say. It's good for everybody else. There's enough for everybody else, but there's not enough for me because I'm just not that important. Well, who said that? Who said that? Because that's a, that's a lie from the pits of hell. Because, again, you're putting yourself at a different standard than everybody else. Jesus died once, and he died for all. And nobody here is so special that his word doesn't apply to you. He's the God of more than enough. God just doesn't hand out enough. God's not shortchanged. Listen, look at Jesus and his miracles. I mean, when he fed the, low, the, 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 the thousands of people, there was always something left over. There was always something left over. You are not God's second choice. You are his daughter. You are his son. God doesn't have grandchildren. God doesn't have stepchildren. You were blood-bought by the spirit of adoption. We cry, Abba, Father. That's why when you don't learn how to forgive yourself and release yourself from the bondage of your own prison, you forget who you are. Adults who, who said cruel things as children or, or engaged in sins as, as teenagers look back with shame on their actions. Some women, you know, even, even when, they, when they've um, experienced abortions, and, and, I, and I've had to minister to many women about this, I made a mistake. They feel like, my God, I, 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 I can't move on from this thing. Listen, I don't care what you've done. I don't care what mistakes you have made. God says, just give it to me. Forgive yourself and begin to move on. God is not God of, of a second chance. He's a God of another chance. You'll experience excessive behavior. And we attempt to overcome guilt by compulsive behavior in our life. We dedicate huge amounts of energy into work, working harder, faster, and longer to keep dealing keep from dealing with the real problem. In other words, you'll develop a works mentality. You know, Buddhists live like that. Buddhists believe that if they have messed up and they have sinned, that for the rest of their life, they have to just keep doing good works so that they can be forgiven and that they can be released. And without even realizing it, because you don't forgive yourself, you're developing a works mentality. Because salvation is not something that you earn. Grace is not something that you earn. It's not something that you can work for. It's something that God gives you because he loves you. No questions asked. And, and, and there's no point in trying to figure out why the God that we serve would think like that, would do that, because we, he's not a man. And we've got to stop putting God on man's level. He loves us with a love that man cannot conceive. His love, his spirit, it is not a human spirit. He loves us unconditionally. He would go, he would do everything that is possible for you to save you. In fact, he did. He did. You know, sometimes I think we get so churched that we understand, in theory, everything that God did. But when you think about the reality, I mean, put yourself for a minute in God's shoes. Look at your own children. Look at your own family who you love. And then look at this world and look at how crazy things are getting. I mean, things are sick. I saw something on Facebook the other day regarding that they're going to try to start to teach kindergartners about all types of sex. 
heterosex, homosexual sex, and not just about the types of sex, but actually how to do a kindergartner. To me, that's sexual abuse. But they're doing it. I think it was Virginia, and they're doing it in all states. They're, they're teaching this whole transgender curriculum everywhere. And it's happening, and it's going down the pike. And, and just think, I mean, we're so offended, and we're, we're, so, we're so upset by this, and we're human. Imagine how God must feel about it. And still, this didn't come, by, come to surprise him. He knew this was happening. And still knowing all of this, he took his son, who didn't do anything but love and serve. He, he was sinless. He was blameless. And God loved these crazy, messed up people to such a point that he sacrificed his own son. This is not a theory. This is reality. That's why when you don't think people love you, listen, I don't care about people loving you. There's somebody who loves you, loves you with an unconditional love, a love that knows no limits. Can you say amen? So you've got to learn how to forgive yourself and don't walk into, you know, there's too many Christian Buddhists. You're Christian, you're saved, but you're walking around in a Buddhist mentality. Because we don't take the word of God, we don't understand what God said. If you come to me, and if I can forgive you, who are you not to forgive yourself? Who are you not to forgive your brother or your sister when they sin against you? And who are you not to forgive yourself if I've already forgiven you? Do we think that we know better than God? And I love that verse. If our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart. Because we're sitting in condemnation and we're living over something that we've done in the past. And God says, listen, your heart's condemning you, but I'm greater than that and I have forgiven you. Because you know what? I know all things. See, sometimes we think we know why we think the way we think or why we did what we did. And God, he goes so far beyond that that he says, the reasoning that you've come up with, because there was something that maybe you don't even remember. But God says, I know all things. So don't let your heart condemn you, but have that confidence in Christ that whom the Son is set free is free indeed. Another thing, and this is a strange thing, but it breeds false humility. It's, well, I'm permanent, it, it, it tells us that I'm permanently judged by God. So when people tell us a nice job and, and, and we don't know how to take that compliment, we say, oh, just give God the glory. We, we wallow in that fake humility as we covet our past errors and focus on our unworthiness. And we deprive of ourselves, I couldn't do that. I couldn't buy that. I couldn't go there because I'm bad. God doesn't ask us to deprive ourselves to merit forgiveness. In other words, what happens is we constantly play the victim. And God didn't make us a victim. Even the devil didn't make us a victim. Except he gave us a victim mentality because we believe the lie. Because we don't understand the power of forgiveness. Is this helping you tonight? Because sometimes we, we can forgive people and we can preach a sermon on that, but we don't, somehow, when it comes to me, I'm, I'm a little different. I can't forgive myself. And I think that God is always judging me. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. Because the truth will set you free, but unless you receive the truth, the truth's not going to do anything for your life. You've got to take God at his word.
Okay, so here are the causes of not forgiving yourself. They're performance-based forgiveness. You remember when your mom, you say, when you say to your mom, can I have a cookie? And she said, if you're good. If I clean my room, mom, will you do this? If I take out the trash, will dad let me do that? And when it comes to the grace of God and the biblical teaching, it's no, it's no assembling required. No, re no performance required. God's forgiveness is in a category all by itself. You are not forgiven based on performance. It, it, it's not about that. And sometimes we just, again, we put God on such a human level. And that's not the way he works. God doesn't say, if you're a good girl, if you're a good boy, I will love you. And I will forgive you. He does say, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. But then he does say, if you blow it, I'm there for you. You come to me. Because I'm your father. And God is always saying, listen, no matter what happens, no matter what you do, you always come home. It's like I tell my, my children all the time. And listen, I thought it was, was going to be easier when they got older. Because when they were younger and they were running, I was so physically exhausted. But now I'm emotionally exhausted. Because now, it, now it's even scary because now they go out and they have a car. And, and they're in college and they're doing this and they're doing that. And, you know, as they get older, and listen, I know that I've put the word of God in them, but I know that they're human. I know the temptations that are out there. I know, I know the pitfalls. I mean, I can see it coming before they can see it coming. And I've had to tell my kids, don't ever think, okay, don't ever think that if you get into trouble to try to hide it, you come home. Because I don't love you because you're a good girl or a good boy. I love you because you're mine, because you're my child. And you love your kids because they're your kids. See, when we understand a parent's love, that no matter what our kids do, I can't, listen, if my kids did some of the worst things, my heart would break. But as a mom now, now I wouldn't let them do it under my roof. Because love doesn't necessarily mean agreement. But I would never turn my back on them. They're not my children only when they do good. They're my children when they get it right, and they're my children when they get it wrong. I can say what I want about them. Don't you say nothing. And everybody will say amen. I would never talk about Matthew. Never. <laughs> so another cause of, of not forgiving yourself is, is also caused by the dis disappointment that you have in yourself. God has done a marvelous work in your life, and then you blow it. That ever happened to somebody? You've been given so much, and then, oh, my God, I, I can't believe I blew it. I can't believe I said that. I cannot believe I blew my testimony in the DMV like that. <laughs> I'm not going to tell that story. God knows it, though, and so does the people at the DMV, but we'll keep that. How can you disappoint God when he already knows what, you, what you're going to do? God knows that we're going to blow it sometimes. God knows that we're going to fall on our face. But what does the Bible say about a righteous man who falls? He gets up. He gets up. Because God doesn't let us go. God is not playing. God is in this for keeps. He said, you are my child. He says, I have etched you in the palm of my hand. He said, you are the apple of my eye. He loves you today. And God does not want you living under a spirit 
of condemnation. The Bible clearly says that old things are passed away. And behold, everything, everything is being made new. And in this series, we're, we're going to talk on Tuesday about soul ties. All the different things that hold us bound. Soul ties of relationships that we've had. Soul ties to circumstances and things. Because until we get free from that, we can't walk into our future. And I thank God that no matter what you've done, what mistakes you've made, there is nothing that the blood of Jesus cannot heal, cannot fix, cannot restore. Nothing. Some of the things that you're so embarrassed that you wouldn't dare even talk about. God says, I knew it before you did it. And I still chose you. And I still gave my life for you. So I want you to think about all the scrambled eggs that you got in your life. And I want you to give those eggs to God and let him make omelets. Make them, make them beautiful. Make them healthy for you. He can bring things that just come out of the worst and the darkest places of your life. Because you know what? Even if the mistake you made can help somebody from not making that mistake, it was worth it. There were things that I went through as a young girl that I did not want my children to ever experience. So when I got pregnant and I had my children, I was on my guard. There were things I knew that not to say. There were things I knew, don't let them get involved in this. Because we learn. And mistakes are never fatal. Unless we don't learn from them. And preachers got to start preaching the blood of Jesus. Because without the blood of Jesus, there is no remissions for sin. Without the blood of Jesus, there is no power. There is no power. Through the blood, we have the power to be saved. Through the, through the blood, we have the power to forgive. Through the, the blood, we have the power to love. We have the power to walk. We've been made more than conquerors. And in this day, in this season, God's saying, listen, I need every one of you, every one of you, to take off that spirit of heaviness, to get rid of that victim mentality. I want you to get into your heart and all of those places, all of those wounds, everything that's ugly, everything that you never wanted to give me. I, I, God is tired of having a piece of you. God wants all of you. God wants your whole heart so that he can give you a heart that is whole. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You guys are so quiet. I'm glad you're listening. Amen. We're going to get ready to take the offering tonight. Kathy's going to come by. If you have your praise and your prayer requests, you can put those in there as well. Um, this is a split between Samantha's Little Bit of Heaven Ministries and Karen Orlando Ministries. And we so appreciate all that you do and pray and, and give and, and serve here and we thank God for you. Uh, just a few announcements. Um, we are happy.